Hello? Hello? Yeah, hi, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So I guess people are still coming in, so we should get started, I think. Uh, um, although, I was hoping to have everyone in class before starting. Uh, well, since we're waiting for people, very quick question. Um, uh, I was just telling uh, Akshay that uh, first I was checking that everyone is caught up. Uh, Marco, are you with the boot camp? Is, are you able to make more headway, or do you need me to hold yeah, more? At all? Okay, then why don't I hold it for you? It's sort of simple, same simpler. Because I thought Pranava had taken care of that. So, okay, if you could just send me an email, because I was under the happy impression it had all been taken care of. So, okay. Uh, okay. So maybe we should figure out when we do it, either this week, weekend, Monday. We can, maybe even... Every... Ah, okay. So, okay. Tomorrow, day after. So maybe at break, before break time, we can figure out... Uh, come again? Yeah, yeah, okay, we can check that. So we can figure out... Uh, okay, okay, so then you must be still... <laughs> okay, then you still have difficulties. Okay, so... Sorry about that. I thought... Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, well, I guess... Just a minute. Hello, Fe Felix. Felix, yeah. is there any noisy at your end? Can you just mute it or do something? Okay. Thanks. A lot of noise here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in future, if things like boot camps don't run, let me know right away because I, I sort of assumed it was your, everything was under control. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so then uh, you're going to help them actually get set up with the data or whatever difficulties they have? Or, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so the one thought, uh, well, I was going to hold off discussion, but since we're waiting for people to come in, the one thought is whether the two teams should be combined a little bit because that might be a little easier for you folks to just get things done. Uh, that's a possible sort of thing to do, I think. Uh, Felix, it's still very noisy. Can you just mute the uh, the uh, the speaker at your end? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so so so. Uh, Felix, are you there? Hello, Felix. It's a lot of noise uh, at this end. Can you some mute it or do something with that? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Come again? Yeah, yeah, but maybe you can mute it at the other end unless people want to talk or ask questions. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Let's say that again. Oh. Here, so yeah, 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 okay. Why don't you just close it down for right now, maybe? Because maybe p people told me they're having a lot of difficulty trying to. Because apparently there's a lag between my speech and where it shows up. So they said they found it much easier to use their own computers. Okay, okay. okay. All right. thanks, cool. thanks. Bye. You can reconnect if, yeah, they're there. Okay, maybe we should just get started because, you know, when people come in, whenever they come in. Uh, uh, the, the, very quickly, my goal today was to do three things. One is to go through recommenders. Since Jimmy's been doing it, hopefully you're in good shape. I just want to review quickly so as to get you caught up. Um, and I was just saying that um, as far as the projects are concerned, we've really learned two things in the course so far. We've learned prediction, which is 
predicting continuous values. We've learned classification, which is saying it belongs to some discrete bucket, right? Those are two things we've learned. The one thing we're now learning is recommenders, and recommenders are useful because when you don't have, sometimes you don't have all the feature data, and yet you need to figure out which bucket to put it into or predict. You need a recommender, so missing data, if you will. Right, so there are three things. So that's all that we've really learned in this course. Uh, and Ray was pointing out, normally, uh, I sort of teach this in a 30, uh, you know, or a period of uh, uh, 30 hours plus more. So, so I, I guess this is quite a bit, uh, just because we've covered a bunch of different techniques. Information extraction, I think I'll uh, talk a little bit about it, but I don't think we'll be able to teach you enough to do something with it, but it's good to get some exposure, because I think information extraction is certainly key to most things you do. Okay, I know, Marco, I'm still looking for that uh, write-up by you. I know you thought that having two things I think you suggested was having a little bit of either a, con a concurrent or a preliminary uh, statistics type of uh, few-unit course would be useful instead of boot camp because boot camp is quite a bit, uh, so get the units for it as well. Mm -hmm. and, and then at least for the high school students, uh, that's one. Any student, that that. Any, any student who's I lacking it. High school. Anyone? Just tell them this is what we expect you to know coming in linear algebra plus statistics. And if you haven't had to take this concurrent course, that's one. Uh, and the other thing you had was that trying to do data mining, as uh, we have discovered, trying to do data mining and information extraction is a bit of uh, overkill. So uh, I, I think uh, because uh, Ray was also pointing out that typically you can have three hours or fourteen, or two hours or fourteen weeks, which gives you more you know scope as well. So, so um, I, I think separating it out into data mining and information extraction would also be helpful because it sort of seems then you, you can just do a manageable uh, core content, I think. Okay. Uh, so, so today what I want to do is first uh, very quickly review recommenders because I just want to make certain that all of you are on top of this. So I'll start going through a little quickly. And if you're right on top of this, I'll go to the more advanced material uh, because uh, it's good to know about recommenders, I think, right? Um, so uh, everyone familiar with search-based recommendations? I'm going to ask you a few questions and then run through the material only if you don't know. So by the way, I believe some people must have enough dinner points. We, I told you how it's counted, right? Uh, do we, how many people am I taking to dinner so far? No one yet? Not, not one single student? This is astonishing. No course have I had students not going to dinner. So we've got to figure this out. Okay. Uh, so, so in terms of uh, search-based recommendations, right? Um, so let's just go to search-based. Uh, uh, so do you folks like search-based recommendations? Do you use search-based recommendations? So what's the search-based recommendation? I put in data mining uh, customer, which is a query, and I got six books, right? So what's the commonality of all six books? Yeah, th those three terms are present, right? So is that a good recommendation? You like it? It's basic, but it's simple. It's basic, but simple. So you look at some commonality of words, right? So, so now, uh, what could be issues here? Well, not very powerful. We'll see why in a moment. Also, if I have lots of, uh, let's assume three terms match, and I have many other terms, well, how do I rank those books, right? That's an issue. And it's just a matching, right? It's not a recommendation. And you get exactly what you asked for. And semantically, uh, let's assume I'm terrible in games, right? And I want to take my nephew to a game. And I don't even know the difference between football and soccer. Something called a ball. So I put a football, right? Then maybe my uh, nephew cares about soccer. So you want something which is semantically equivalent as well, right? And that's something that's not available in these. OK. Um, Category-based recommendations. So is this something you also see? you know, computers, databases. How often do you see, where do you see it? When you go to some particular websites and within that they make you go deeper and deeper, right? The classification. Hmm? And their classification. classification. Yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, this is not classifying based on your features of you, right? It's just, you're just delving, it's like a taxonomy which is exploding, that's all, right? So it's sort of useful. And, uh, you know, you, they can, of course, make it a function of what you looked at previously and so on, right? Uh, but uh, uh, but still not complete, right? And uh, for example, uh, I, I guess if you're interested in bioinformatics uh, or computers, it may bring this up, right? Okay. Now, 
the, the problem is that these categories may be either too specific, in which case it's not efficient, or too broad. So, so it's how do you customize to an individual user, right? That's the big issue. That's one thing that's a little tricky. Now, collaborative filtering is what uh, uh, I started talking about and then Jimmy has been covering, right? This is today the most powerful technique that is in use, especially after the Netflix challenge. Everybody thinks in terms of this, which to me it was not a very natural way of thinking. I thought much more content-based, which I'll come to in a moment, because I was looking at search problems. Uh, so clearly the idea is you look at how people bought previously and you try to figure out which users were similar to me, right? So you find those customers who are similar to this particular user or a customer in terms of taste, preferences, and past behavior, right? You're sort of, they're all lumped together in some sense. Now, then you may also weight them because the question is, if I look at Mark and I look at Marco, then which movies do they like compared to the ones I like, right? So, so I need to weight each of you because maybe Marco and I have seen a thousand movies which are overlapping and maybe Mark and I only two, surprisingly. But maybe we'll have to figure out how to weight that, right? So, so, so how do you do all this aggregation across all these different users with, who are similar or different, but maybe there are many more instances or fewer instances, right? And so, uh, doing this, uh, making this uh, recommendation based on these aggregated weighted preferences. Uh, now, not only then do you want to uh, make the most likely recommendation, but say I already bought it. This is a big point that Google has been making to me that there are two effects which are not captured. One is, if I've already seen something, why would I want to have it rec uh, recommended back to me, right? No matter how pertinent it is. And the other part of it is they're looking for, how about some diversification? Because I go to a Chinese restaurant all the time, right? Hey, maybe I want Indonesian or Bali Balinese or something, I don't know, right? So, so th those are the sort of things that Google, and people who do this for a living, right? That's what they're telling me about. So I think we went through this example, right? I don't need to go through the book example again. Now, so we went through this. Now in clustering, uh, clustering you should be able to do quite well, right? You want to look at recommendations based on past purchases of other customers who are similar to me or close to me in features, right? Looks reasonable. So the difference between this clustering and the recommenders is that in recommenders, sometimes some of the features may be missing. Here, a lot of them may be present, right? Or you can try to fudge one from the other. That's the point of clustering, right? So, in some sense, the cluster will be uh, almost assigned or attributed preferences of the users. That's the game plan here. Now, do you see any possibility of using any of these approaches for, uh, let, let's, let's just finish this a moment and then I'll, I'll go back to the question of the project. So, Come again? You know, when you had like the data mining courses on the IT. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it depends, on, yeah. So the question is what level category, right? Because you can have subcategories. Yeah. So, so, so it depends on the level of the category. But the names of the categories are the same as the names of the categories of the products. Uh, as the categories of the? Of the products. Oh, no, 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 you'll aggregate them, right? So yeah. think of all data mining books. You may have a data mining book connected with bioinformatics. You may have a data mining book connected with business. So the higher level aggregation or category is data mining books. And then those to do with bioinformatics, those to do with business. And then within business, you may have to do with data mining for finance, data mining for marketing, and so on, right? And then when you're, when you're clustering the customers between the categories, so the people. Also, you start associating. So there's a hierarchical structure. So, so in one reason, what I'm not going into here is, that's one reason this so-called hierarchical Bayesian models have become very popular in data mining. Because you can always start with the higher category where there's a commonality, and you drop down, and there's a little differentiation, and you keep going. But often, at the very most detailed level, you don't have enough data points. So you may want to start aggregating at an appropriate level and keep going back and forth between the different levels. And so that's where you use. So that's getting into all the more sophisticated models, whereas this description is very aggregate, rough cut approaches. Whereas the devil is in the details, as I say, right? So. Okay, everybody with me? Okay. Uh, so clustering, again, here you see book two, right? B, C, D, all three customers like book two. 
correct? And then apparently book three is also liked by B and C. So you can start seeing they look fairly similar, right? So, so you could think of clustering. Would you think of clustering the users or the books? <laughs> what do you think? Right? Because if all three of them want to say, read book two, and a couple of them want to read book three, then maybe they're similar in nature, right? Because, so the feature here is the book that they like. Right? Now, if you think of the preferences of the cluster, book two appears in B, C, D, all those customers, right? But three appears only in B and C, right? Correct? Because three is seen only by B and C, book three. Whereas book two is two, three, uh, B, C, D, right? So if you cluster B, C, D, and A and D are clustered separately, right? So the reason is, if I look at uh, A and E, well, uh, it transpires that if I look at A and E, they look at book one together, but uh, A looks at four, E looks at five. So there's only one book common, right? Whereas if I think of B, C, D, uh, all three of them share book two. And then B and C also share a second book three, right? So B, if you think of the cluster B, C, D, then you are saying that the preferences for book cluster one, B, the B, C, D cluster book two is very high and book three is high, correct? For A and D, then you can rec you can recommend. Uh, let's see. Look, look at five and six, right? So, so the question is, under what conditions would I recommend uh, book five? Well, apparently customer B likes two, three, and five. So since C and D like book two, C likes three, then you hope that book five is something that you may want to recommend to that group, right? But it's more likely that C will, uh, sorry, uh, that um, C of C and D, right, uh, D has got, there seems more commonality, whereas here there may be a little less commonality, right? So it's sort of, it's, it's a preference issue. I mean, it's got a degree of preference. And one and four you don't recommend at all, because, well, one is already there, right? In, in some sense, correct? So, so that's the basic idea. So if you see, the ideas are sort of similar, but you'll see they get much more refined as we progress towards more sophisticated recommenders. That's the basic point here. Okay. Yeah. So um, you know, if you're probably going to emphasize that you can see book, that many books for business and so on. But if you just have a system where I don't know, people are uploading documents and you don't know what type they are, they're not being categorized, and you're trying to cluster, huh. can you? Aha, that's content, ba that's content based. Okay. Th that's exactly the point. So, that, uh, so here, see, you're using a very short title as a surrogate for everything. Mm -hmm. But if you start looking at the content, now to me that is a very amazing thing, that content apparently often is not that indicative of similarity of, uh, in recommendation. To me that was a shock, because I was, uh, well also as a research program, so I was talking to companies saying, hey, I can do all the search, I can match things. And then when I suddenly discovered the literature, I said, what am I doing? You know, I really found it hard to believe. So, but apparently it's sort of partly empirical evidence. But I'll tell you if things change as I keep working with companies. So. But that's the, so sometimes that tells you a little bit of the benefit of looking at literature, right? And I often think, don't look at the literature because it brainwashes you too much. Start working on it and sometimes it does, I mean, but at some point you have to come back to it, right? So, so I'll, I'll skip, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, so any, all, all we're doing is we'll set up a cluster, we'll look at members in a cluster, and then recommendations are based on everybody in the cluster, right? So in other words, they're, they're similar because of some, uh, you know, so, in other words, you and I like, say we have three of us in a cluster. The two of you like some books together. You and I like some books together. He and I like some books together. But so if the other books which only one or two of us may have read, not the other one, will also be recommended to this other people because we are in the cluster. That's the basic concept, right? 
So you can sort of see that's the basic idea of all these things, right? Not very different. Now, then they've done something else. So here, um, so our, our, uh, in clustering, you can look at it by clusters of customers or you can look at clusters of books, right? So you, in other words, if you say, hey, a book was read by, you can say which set of books may be clustered, right? As opposed to which set of customers may be clustered, yeah. right? That's the other approach. And so that's the other cut that's being taken in this little pink in the second picture here, right? Now, the other problem is if a customer belongs to more than one uh, uh, cluster, that's another headache, right? So what do you do with that? So let's look at this. Now, if I look at... Uh, no, 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 okay, so there are two concepts. Right, uh, clustering by, by the book title itself or clustering by the customer Yeah, that's one, one concept. Okay. The second concept is if I've got, uh, and, and let's look at that, if, if I've got, uh, um, you, you know, uh, here we are saying a customer belongs to one cluster or the other. But you can see a customer, a customer can belong to two clusters, right? So, for example, I like science fiction books. I also like comedy. I also like uh, murder mystery. So now if you start looking at all the books I like, maybe, but maybe you like only action movies or something, and I like action movies too. So I belong to your group as an action movie uh, aficionado, right. but maybe uh, Mark and I are uh, more into British uh, comedy or something like that, right? So then how do you attribute, I mean, how do you assign me? Do I assign me to the Marco cluster, Marco book cluster, yeah. or to the Mark book cluster? Would it, would it depend on, are you assuming that there's no input from the user? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just, yeah. This is just based. Not yeah, yeah. No, no. We are not yet capturing any uh, input from you. So you just have to infer as much as you can in an unsupervised manner. So, so there, one possible thing to do might be, you know, you could sort of say, um, that, uh, I mean, l let's take an example. Uh, uh, now, you, you could sort of say, if I think of customers C and D, right, book two, they overlap. If I think of customer B and C, they overlap in, customer, in, in book three, right? So I can think of clusters and attribute across those, right? See that? So then it becomes an issue of trying to figure out how do I compose the book cluster or how do I think of the set of books which are clustered, and then how do I associate customers with each of them, right? So it gets to be trickier and trickier. Yeah. So in the second case, you're clustering books, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you, you can do books. But, um, but I'm saying you need to think about, we're talking about now three different things. One is clusters of, uh, based on the books that people like, you cluster customers, right? Okay. Because they like similar books. Or you can say, uh, based on the customers, what sort of books may fit in there, right? It's sort of, it's both. It's clusters of, it's clusters of customers, it's clusters of books. And, and the two keep getting mixed up, right? So, so if you see here, so here, the customers B, C, D are clustered together, right? But you could have thought of if I think of book two and three, we can cl cluster those as well, right? Because somehow a lot of customers, uh, so think about it. Book two, clearly three customers like it, right? Now, if I think of book one and two, do you think they're similar? No, because A and E like book one, B, C, D like book two. So somehow you cannot cluster book one and book two. But if I think of book two and three, can I cluster them together? Because B, C, D, there's some overlap, right? So now we are able to start clustering the books. Everybody you think? You're assuming a similar, based on, you know, similarity between the books based on the common out of the common high rating by the customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is based on the ratings. That's the point of collaborative filtering. Which to me was very peculiar because I thought, hey, if I know the content of a book, because we were looking at Cisco about documents, and whether somebody would like to pick up this document or that document. I said, well, who cares, you know? 
if I look at the content, I can figure it out. But if I'm only looking at one sentence, which is an important sentence out of 100 pages, then matching content may be highly misleading, right? Because these guys as humans are looking at the one line. So what we're trying to go to actually is to get rid of all the 100 pages to come to that one page or one line or whatever that helps people disambiguate. But that's another problem. You kind of harness the user's judgment, the value that's given by the user's judgment um, based on the rating that they give. The rating is representative of their, their judgment of the book. Yeah, yeah. So clustering is nice, and you work on aggregated data, but I'm going to show you in the collaborative filtering algorithms, uh, uh, right? Collaborative filtering is a rating-based approach, if you will. Uh, we'll see that we actually have slightly more sophisticated approaches, and you have this notion of neighbors, right? People are similar to you in some sense, right? So that if, some, if data is missing, I look at who's more similar and go with their preferences, right? So we use that to shrink the the total number of uh, uh, candidates under consideration to say, hey, given something new, do I recommend it to you or not? The, they, they probably, in fact, let me give you a very interesting use case. We were at Facebook. And so the question they were asking is, if any of you go to Facebook and you sign up, right, they have a bunch of applications. Any of you Facebook users? Okay, which application do you like? None of them. None of them, okay. Which one have you tried? Yeah. Huh? Uh, text insertion, focus. Okay, okay. So the question is, when you start, right, how do they know uh, what application they should recommend to you out of several that they have, which one might you be most inclined to enjoy, right? Because if you do it, then you like them and have trust in them. So what they do is they actually mine previous users for their demographics. For example, if you're a boy versus a girl. Now, all this is based on self-declared features, right? That's the goofy thing about Facebook. I know Peter Norwig, who's the head of search at uh, uh, Google, he tells me his daughter changes her sex on Facebook, uh, you know, the sort of self-declared thing every day or two just to fool the engine, uh, uh, right? Uh, so, 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 so basically, uh, you know, people self-declare, you sort of believe them, and then you ask, given that, what can I say about preferences, right? So they wanted us to think, consider the problem of recommending new applications as users came in. Right? So, because then people say, hey, these guys know what I want, right? That's the type of thing. So, so, so in all this, if I've got a billion people, if I can shrink that to maybe a few thousand, that makes it much easier, right? So you can use clustering as one approach. But this, sort of, this is what you might call, uh, what I would call, a little heuristic and hand wavy. And you, you need to be much more precise, right? But by the way, a lot of people, uh, industrial algorithms are of this, of this hand wavy nature. So, so, I mean, I'm sure in your interaction with Claritex, right, they're doing very rudimentary things, right, nothing fancy. Right? And, so, and yet, they sell and make lots of money, right? So that's the interesting thing. There. Okay. So the recommendations per cluster, so see, recommendations are all at a cluster level, right, when you make a cluster, because for everybody in the cluster, you're making a recommendation. Whereas recommendation engines look at each of each individual and compare that individual to everybody else. So uh, recommendations there are being made at, the in, at an individual level. But at cluster level recommendations, all cl individuals in a cluster, you don't dis distinguish or disambiguate between them. They all get the same recommendation. Do you see the big difference? So certainly collaborative filtering is going towards personalization much more, or degrees of personalization, I would say. Now, association rules, you remember that? Did uh, Jimmy cover that? Okay, in case you've forgotten. So is this refresher useful for you people? Okay, because I think maybe the way you want to think about it is, I'm sort of giving you different elements and pieces, but Jimmy should be, you know, if you go to his boot camp, you should be able to really dig in and do all the detailed work, right? That's, that's our goal. And I'll be helping you fill in the details of the boot camp and other portions I'm covering. Now, clustering works at a group or cluster level, and we said that collaborative filtering is working at a customer level. And the association rules work at the item level. And let's try to understand what that means. So let's assume we have a bunch of users, right? What we want to do is not focus so much on the users, but we say, hey, you know what? Let's convert all this into some sort of relationship between common purchases, right? So you say A bought napkins and uh, sandwiches. 
Uh, is, oh, is he looking for something? That's just Shankar. <laughs> hey, Shankar, are you looking for something? No, no, no. Ah, okay. So, uh, what we do is, uh, past purchases, uh, so you say A bought item one and, uh, sorry, napkins and sandwiches, right? And then you ask, hey, B bought napkins and sandwiches. So after a while, it doesn't matter whether A, B, or C looked at them. Every time anybody bought napkins, they bought sandwiches, right? So, so that's the idea here, that if you've got customer uh, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, and you have book one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now we're gonna map all this, which is customers and books, into just relationship between books. See? So if you do that, book one. Well, apparently a customer who bought book one bought book four, right? One and four. Now, apparently somebody who bought book one bought book five. Well, that's not customer A, is it? You have customer book one, book five, but that's customer E. So you're really combining customers into related purchasing. Do you see that? So you don't care about customers per se, but you say, hey, whoever bought this item bought that item. See that? So you construct a new table. So starting with this table, you can construct this table, right? And so this is called an, so this is a, the, the table that you construct for an association rule. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, a lot of this stuff is based on this. So, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, Rakesh Agrawal at IBM, they, they had this 90, 92, 95, another tray. This, this is supposed to be the most frequently cited paper in data mining. Looks very rudimentary and basic, right? I mean, paper is a little bit more sophisticated than that. But, uh, you know, everyone buys these point of sale items, right? You go and Safeway or something, chung, chung, chung. So, so you construct these tables, right? So, so a market basket. So that, that's one of the core results. So you combine these book two, book six, if you see customer D, right? And so you say, hey, this is book two, book six. So against book two and book six, you put a one, right? So, so and similarly, if I take this item of book six and book two, I put a one there, right? It's sort of symmetric, right? Everybody with me? So then, of course, you can use these uh, association rules for uh, uh, recommendations, right? So any particular visitor, you come in, by person says, hey, I like book five. Then you say, you know what? Book five, great. But you know, a lot of people looked at book uh, five. Two people who looked at book five also looked at book three. So why don't I recommend book three to you? No. Uh, looks good? Happy? Any problems? Still rudimentary, and hey, maybe there are a set of people who look at book five and who like book three, and a set of people who looked at the book five and didn't want book three, right? And you can't distinguish between them. But, okay. Is it bought or rated? Uh, could be either one. In this particular case, you can construct the, uh, if it's purchased or not purchased, you can construct the matrix based on bought. Yeah, that, that, you could have bought it and rated it really low. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So rating is something where they voted with their uh, pocketbook, right? Right. I mean, casting their vote with money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas the rating, hey, you could be a little casual about it. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. I agree. So this has a higher degree of confidence, and, and the degree of confidence here, by the way, talking of confidence, the fact that uh, if, if somebody bought, you know, every time a book five was bought, somebody bought book uh, say six ten times. And certainly, you're more confident, right? There's a confidence level. And why might that happen if you like Harry Potter 1? Maybe Harry Potter 2 is a natural thing. Or if I liked, uh, uh, you know, B the BBC production called Downtown Abbey. It's astonishing. As soon as I mention it to people, uh, people who are BBC FS scenarios, they say, wow, yes. 
You know, there's such a strong connection, right? So sometimes, the, you know, there are certain very highly dependent uh, or associated uh, uh, items that it's, uh, you can, with a very high degree of confidence, assert, yes, I recommend this. Right? That's the, so these numbers are more indicative of that, right? Okay. Now, the other question, of course, is here, you say somebody bought it, didn't buy it, or ratings. But let's assume, hey, I'm going to rate a restaurant on the basis of food, of service, of ambiance, right? Then how do you do it? That becomes a little trickier, right? So then you may want to aggregate recommendations. So, um, so for example, if, uh, so, so this is, sorry, there's another, there are two types of aggregations. This is what I refer to as one type of aggregation. Another type of aggregation is if a user is interested in book three and five. So three and five, right? So if you look at three, then two looks a natural choice, right? Because three, if you look at three and five, three, they overlap with book two, right? And of course, five is already interested. Now, if I look at book, uh, book two, then it overlaps with book five, right? So only by looking at three and five is, uh, is book three also recommended, right? Everybody clear? If I only looked at book three, then book two is a natural choice. Do you agree? If I look at book three, book two is associated with it, right? Now, if I, book five is associated with the three. But if I look at book five, then book one is only, uh, book two is only one, but there are two people who bought book three as well, right? So I recommend book three as well. Do you see that? So it's an aggregation concept. So they're very rudimentary things, but they work, right? So by the way, yeah, don't ever let anyone tell you, including a professor, that rudimentary is bad. Sometimes simple is beautiful, right? So and also a lot of complicated ideas are built on simple insights. Okay. So all these association rules, why, why are they so popular and why are the paper so famous, right? Because they're fast to implement, fast to execute, not much of storage space. You get rid of individuals and cast everything into item space, right? And it's very uh, applicable because I told you, shelf uh, layout in retail stores, right? They, they look at all these point of sale information and they construct these tables, right? It's very useful. The only problem is if the preferences change rapidly, then you know, you have a lot of information, right? But parts of it are changing. So it may be outdated, right? And that's a mess. Because you're constructing, remember you're constructing these big tables, right? That's the basic problem. Uh, so it's sort of tempting to uh, not to apply, uh, uh, not, sorry, not to not, not to apply restrictive confidence rules, right? But if you don't have a confidence uh, level, then you know, the number here is a two, five, it makes a big difference of how many items are really strongly related, right? If you have very few, you have a one, making a recommendation could be dangerous because there are very few items to truly associate with, right? Enough data points. But people might be inclined to do that. So that's the other type of thing. Now, what is information filtering? So association rules are comparing items based on past purchases. And information filtering compares items based on their content as we spoke about. And it's called content-based filtering or content-based recommendation. And again, uh, if you think of the Netflix challenge, right? Are all of you, all of you familiar with IMDB data? What is IMDB data? Movie database. Movie database, right? So would it have things like the movie, action, adventure, feature, uh, who's the actor, year, director, or something? Yeah. Now, so you have attributes or features or characteristics. You can also have textual content, right? The description and so on, right? So you can use, uh, we've already done text in class, right? So you know how to compare how close things are because you use cosine as a measure and so on, right? Good, I see nodding of heads. You're already getting to be a little bit more familiar with what you need to do to hit up. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're interviewing, are you chatting with people about what you've been learning and so on? Or uh, is that coming across in your interviews at all? Or you have, or you finished interviewing already? Ah, okay, okay. Maybe as you talk to people, uh, you know, in different places, right? Uh, so here, uh, TF-IDF is a very popular, long-standing approach in uh, 
the uh, information retrieval area. So Ray has been in that area much longer than I have been. So he can uh, watch say for its performance. It's sort of, again, it looks very simple, but amazing how robust it is and how people keep coming up with complicated things. So I believe the first paper which actually came up with probabilistic models, TF is term frequency in the document which you've done, right? And inverse document frequencies, if I look at all the terms, by the way, have I covered inverse document frequency yet in class? Okay, Akshay, what is info, uh, IDF? Very good. So inverse document frequencies, if I've got, say, uh, a term occurs 20 times and there are 100 documents, right? So a term frequency is how many times did a term occur uh, in, per document on the average? The other possibility is if a term occurred, right, and there's, say, 100 documents. Uh, and, and so you're really trying to understand how infrequently, uh, how many documents, right, may have had this term or not had this term. Right? It's not so many... How many times does the term occur in a document? It's more, you know, how likely is it that a document contains this term, right? I mean, that's the notion of the inverse document frequency. Because if, if very few documents contain a term, then that means it's likely if you see a term, that means it corresponds to some of those documents, right? So think of documents which are relevant to swimming and those which are not relevant to swimming, right? So if you have swimming or trunk or... Uh, uh, maybe salt water or something, right? I mean, those terms may be more indicative, right? But then you're trying to figure out, but let's assume you say water. Well, you can have water uh, in uh, drinking water or uh, tea or something, right? So you want a term which is very swimming trunks, maybe. A trunk, well, maybe it's, uh, luggage. So you want something which is distinctive so that uh, only a few documents contain this, right? That's the notion of inverse document frequency, right? Uh, so, so basically, the TF-IDF measure is something that you use. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to get a little scrambled uh, because you want to look at a text document and you look at word occurrences. And well, you know, stopping and stemming. I'm not going to uh, right. All of you are familiar with stopping and stemming, and you transform it into. I apologize about this uh, text here. It's transformed into a norm TF-IDF vector, and, I, and we showed you how to compute that, right? So, so basically. You sort of normalize to account for the um, uh, for the IDF as well, okay? And people have now interesting for many many years. People use this intuitively, and I think it was probably only in the 1980s or 90s the first paper on probabilistic models using this notion came up that that IDF comes out as a natural consequence of using probabilistic model uh, models or documents, okay? So. So you define TF IDF this way, and TF is. Um, did we cover the fact that when we do term frequency, we often take log of the counts, not use the direct counts? Do you remember that? No, we didn't do it. Okay. Sometimes we count the uh, the number of times something occurs. It may not be as relevant because maybe it saturates in some sense. The, in, in, say I saw the word five times versus twenty times. Well, if I saw auto, I saw it. Right? It's not adding that much information content to me. So you know, sometimes take the log of the number of times the word occurs plus one, and that's how you use term frequency. Okay, that's one way of normalizing it. Now the IDF is you look at the number of documents, uh, and we'll, let's forget the one for the time being, and then divide it by the number of documents the term occurs in. Right. So let's assume you had ten, uh, twenty documents, and the term occurred in only two of them. Right. So it sort of tells you, on the average, this word is occurring, right? Uh, every time I see it occur, it occurs one out of 10. So the less frequent it is, the more meaningful it is, right? And that's the basic measure of IDF, right? And uh, so you take the product of both these, and then you see what is this number in each, for each term, right? Because every term may have a TF and an IDF. So you're trying to see the strength of each term or the, or the impact of each term. So you look at TF-IDF, but then you sort of add up this TF-IDF squared so that you're looking at it uh, in the, if you think of it in some sense, the uh, Euclidean metric sort of idea, right? So that's what you're looking at. OK. You can sneak in. <laughs> OK. OK. Um, 
so so now if i've got uh, so, so in other words we're not looking if you think of uh, cosine you, what does cosine capture does it come, uh, capture tf and idf the cosine measure anyone who gives me an answer gets dinner without uh, adding up 20 points uh, everybody remembers the cosine measure i've got two documents i have a vocabulary size tf is the number of times a term occurs Right, um, so when I'm looking at how similar two documents are, and I use a cosine measure, I'm TF, no IDF, right? So I could modify instead of using TF, I could use every term. I could give it a weight called TF IDF as computed this way, right? And then I can do cosine, right? That's a heuristic as it was done originally, but I can do many other things, right? So now, so if I now look at eight books, so let's assume I'm trying to figure out how do I recommend, I'm given eight books. How do I recommend a book based only on the title? Looks reasonable? So look at the, uh, I won't go through all the names. You see data mining is common. CRM sometimes is common. One is about websites, another about marketing, consumer. It's consumer behavior has nothing about data mining, right? Do you see that? But it, it may be based on data mining, but it's not, we don't know. Okay, so now we're trying to see how do I recommend a book. So now, I've got lots of terms, right? Along the uh, rows here. Accelerating, application behavior, consumer, handbook. You see all this? So now, now in each of the books, the titles, you see the titles, right? So you see how many times here application occurred once, Building occurred once. Here, relationship occurred twice. Customer relationship using CRM and relationship technologies. Wow. That's a little unusual, right? In a query or a title, it would be very unusual to see the same term occur twice, right? That's the problem, by the way. So whereas if you have two documents, how frequently do terms occur is a much easier thing to check, right? But anyway, you do see that, right? So given this table, the question is, if I now have a query, let's see how, which of these titles is most pertinent to that, right? So what we're going to do, we converted, instead of just having term frequency, which is what we have here, we computed term frequency times IDF uh, vectors with, with the, uh, where we computed, for every term, we compute both the term frequency and the inverse document frequency. Can we do that? So if I take a term such as accelerating, can anybody tell me how to compute the uh, inverse document frequency? Log of two divided by eight. Okay, let's look at that. So we've got, look at the number of documents plus one. Oops, Upside down. You had a total of eight documents plus one, nine, okay. divided by the number of time documents the term occurs in, which was one. one. So log of nine, right? Now, uh, Similarly, if I look at now, let's assume I take, uh, now let's take this, customer. How about this one? How about customer? It occurred in three documents, or three titles. So, on top, the total number of documents is still the same, eight plus one nine, divided by three, log of that, right? So you can see that, uh, right? So if it occurs in uh, more documents, the number is coming down, right? IDF is becoming smaller. The more the number of documents which, which this term occurs, the smaller this quantity is, right? Does it make sense? That means it's less unique. So you can't say, if I see this term, wow, it belongs to this set of documents, right? Okay. Now, so we construct, if you take data as an example, we compute that I have 0 0.187, which is what? What is that? What is 0 0.187? Hmm? And the same data. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the question is, if I think of TF-IDF, is there something I associate with a, a given document or the whole corpus of documents? A given document. I mean the, the IDF. IDF? Relates to the whole body document. You get dinner. You get dinner. Right? So you combine. So that's why these values are changing between the two titles, right? Because IDF remains the same, but term frequency is changed between the two, right? And so this count is changing when I compute this value, correct? Everybody with me? Okay. So now, let's see what happens. Mastering data mining, right? So this is mastering data mining, and this is data mining your website. So, so somehow this particular term has a higher weight, apparently, in data mining your website rather than this. Can you tell me why? I would argue that the difference in, ro in rows is because the other document is coming to the second book. Come, come again? Okay. Uh, by the way, is the question clear to everybody? OK, we're trying to say term frequency will tell you that certain terms are important, right? The more frequently I see a term, maybe it's more important, right? We also said inverse document frequency is important because I don't see it as frequently. It's sort of, it's a little confusing. Is, is the frequency more important or not seeing it as a frequently important? Everybody with me about the idea of content? So, so the problem is, if I, if I, if I think I think auto, auto, auto many times in a document, hey, it looks great, but maybe uh, uh, well, it, but if every document has auto 10 times, it's not so significant, right? So I want to not only see whether something is frequent, but I want to see it's infrequent, uh, it, it's infrequent in terms of number of documents in which it occurs. Whereas the frequency in any given document may want to be, uh, need to be high, right? So I have a term. So a term has significance if its frequency in a given document is high, but in terms of all the documents, it happens or occurs relatively infrequently. That's the idea. So that's why we are computing for every given document. We look at a term, data, and we look at this title, Mastering Data Mining, and we look at the TF-IDF, we get 0.187. The same term, data, when I look at a document title called Data Mining Your Website, the TF-IDF is 0.316. So in some sense, that means it's a higher weightage I'm getting, and higher is better, right? So I'm asking you, can you tell me why the same term in the second website has got, uh, is giving you more, uh, more punch, if you will, or a higher value compared to the, the first title. Yes. I think it's just because the second title is shorter. Thank you. Dinner again. OK. You're catching up in a hurry. Good. So, so in other words, the same term, if it's present in a shorter document, it has a higher weight. Because your IDF, if the IDF is higher, right? So it's, 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 so somehow, but that's not an obvious thing, right? Because IDF refers to how many, how many times is this term present across documents, right? Right? So that's not necessarily the answer, right? I'm, I'm saying, intuitively it looks as though a, 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 a term in a smaller document should have higher significance, right? But if you look at a TF IDF, we didn't account for that. Okay, IDF is going to be the same for both. Yeah, but the TF okay, yeah, but the term, term frequency is going to be like it's kind of a fraction of like TF is kind of like the cost thing we did the last year when we normalize. Okay, but here's TF, right? Just log of count plus one. Yeah. So you're trying to think in a longer title. You have a count. You normalize each of the book titles. Yeah. So in the longer title. Yeah, so you're talking of more the concept of normalizing for document length. Yeah. But here in this expression, where do you find that? It's there, but uh, in the denominator. Very good. Do you see that? So it's not just TF-IDF, but this TF-IDF computation is not just multiplying TF times IDF, but you're saying 
how, how does this compare with the TF-IDF across with all the other documents, right? So the other documents, exactly, right? So that's how it kicks in. So it's a little complicated, don't you think? But everybody with me? So we packed a lot of understanding of information retrieval into 10 minutes. Everybody clear about this point? So, a customer wants a, 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 in the book called Building Data Mining Applications of CRM, right? So one out of the eight books. So then it shows data mining your website as the closest match, accelerating customer relationships using CRM as the second one and so on. So can you tell me why it chose one, a shorter thing, because the other one says CRM, oh sorry, CRM, so any idea why it behaved the way it did in giving you one, two, three? Yes. Yeah, and, and CRM matched in the book too. But mastering data mining, the art and science of customer relationship management, should semantically have been probably closer, right? But the engine didn't figure it out. You see that? So just matching words. See, the point to notice is that's why search engines are dumb. I mean, they're intelligently dumb, right? So. And, and the whole idea, if you think of Bing and uh, uh, Google's current efforts, right, and the reason I guess Bing has not 30% market share or whatever, uh, amazingly, is because they're trying to make them smarter. So, so the simplest the cosine is just almost like a word overlap deterministically. And then term frequency idea for all slightly smarter heuristics. But you still miss semantic things. So you know the work we've done, we've been doing with uh, Cisco. You actually use there's something called WordNet. So every time there's a term, you can have a dictionary which tells you what are similar words or equivalent words, like a thesaurus, synonyms, and so on. So then you can match all, or sometimes a semantic explanation of the whole thing. So you can match across all these. That makes it much more powerful. Okay. So a very quick, uh, this is a bit of a, I mean, this is take, been taking a while, but hopefully this is also the guts of a search engine, right? We, we did this singular value decomposition based approach. So now you've also learned about search engines. So the nice thing about this information filtering is you don't need any past history at all, right? You just match on base of terms. Very easy to implement. However, the problem with it is it's very static recommendation. It just looks at the current content, right? It doesn't look at your behavior. So as I told you, the surprising part, as in this Netflix, Netflix, they did not let you use the IMDB data. Yeah, they didn't. It was not set up that way. I mean, it was available if you wanted to go scroll the web, but that's not how, that was not the competition. But I think people later on found, yes, it does benefit you a little bit, but not so much more using IMDB. So that is the peculiar part, that if you apparently if people like certain movies, the, the, any of this other information is relatively marginal. And to me that was somewhat astonishing. Okay. So now, given all this, finally we come to classification as an approach for recommenders, right? Now how can I think of classifiers uh, as recommenders, any idea? Well, what you can do is you can look at item features, as I told you, action, adventure, the hero is Bruce Willis or whatever. Any of you watch Bruce Willis movies? No. Uh, I see Ray nodding his head. Well, us professors, maybe perhaps adventurous in spirit, if not in, right, Ray? So, so, so. Oh, oh, no. Okay. That's right. So, well, that's right. No Harry Potter types, correct. The, the preferences of customers, <laughs> like action in it, which this is called dry humor. Uh, uh, so so uh, preferences of customers, right? They like action or adventure and so on, is something you can account for. And relations amongst items are things you may want to somehow capture in your input features, right? 
So the output is classification, right? In other words, hey, why don't you choose this movie because you like adventure movies? That's what I'm recommending for you today. Also, or you can rank order movies. You can give a preference estimate, right? And we haven't covered neural networks and so on, but you can get other models. So uh, now, all of you remember train, uh, classify as well? You have features, you have classes. And then you have training data where both the features and the class label are given to you. So you fit a model. And then given any new data, when only the input features are given, you predict the new class, right? And then you see how well it performs, right? So the nice thing about a classifier is very versatile. And you can always combine it with other methods, right? Because everything else, all other methods can be a feature. That's the beauty of it. Everybody with me? A number of, uh, so we've used classifiers in looking at Cisco data when the bag of words, the terms, can be features, right? So which terms are more useful than others in predicting whether this document refers to a movie or not? And you can figure out after a while, hey, which feature, what is the weight of each feature, right? Now, we, when we did the classification, do you remember R squared? Did we talk about R squared? If I have classification algorithms, uh, if I have prediction algorithms, and I do regression, and I look at every coefficient, right? R squared or adjusted R squared gives me a sense of how important is this feature. So I can certainly assess when I do regression how useful is a bag of uh, uh, words. In any bag of words, how useful or how valuable is every term is something I can estimate, right? So you can always uh, so sim uh, you can always combine with other methods to improve the uh, accuracy of the recommendation. Well, the so-called con is you need a relevant training set. That means you need human inputs, right? You need some labeling already, pre-labeling. Okay, this simple version is done. Should we take a quick break? So uh, I was hoping to cover more. Uh, let's see here. So I, I, let's take a quick five-minute break. Well, I was hoping to discuss both the more advanced features of recommenders and talk about the um, a project and talk about information extraction, but it sort of seems that let's talk a little bit more about the project and about the recommenders and then go on to information extraction next, I think. Now also maybe we should also think of a time, after break time, let's, maybe you want to talk, let's think of what time may be good for boot camp because I presume it is done, so I, I'd better take care of it quickly because that is my...
So was co that command R a good thing to have? Nice integrated uh, platform. Uh, Did everybody catch that presentation when you have a nice integrated platform for, yeah? So previously, Jimmy and I were looking at just some Excel sheets, and they have like loads and loads of traces of data. Uh, I remember in the presentation they said there's like over 100, and we put them down. They, they like personally identified about 11 features that they think are important, and way to go to combine those in such a way to give each house uh, metric that they call Euclidean distance. Yeah, so it's sort of nice because you have prediction methods. We've done regression in class, right? So they're saying uh, do regression of the sales prices uh, versus the uh, measured Euclidean distance or whatever the, the, the score. And then they're saying 